about it. Well, hello, my name is James Stoner. I'm director of the Eric Vogel Institute at Louisiana State University. And it's my privilege to welcome you back for the fourth in a five part series of talks on the theme, who was Eric Vogelin and what did he think? Uh, Vogelin taught here at LSU from 42 to 58, 1942 to 58, and achieved international notice at, uh, during his time here. Um, we uh, turn today to several essays he wrote uh, at, at the most mature point of his career, uh, actually, I guess right after retiring, uh, uh, that appear in the Eric Vogelin Reader. We've been following the reader as sort of our guide uh, to introduce Vogelin. Uh, we're very honored to have as our guest today, uh, Dr. David Walsh, who's professor of politics at Catholic University of America. Uh, Dr. Walsh hails from Ireland and is the author of a number of different, he received his PhD from the University of Virginia and is the author of a number of different books. Uh, most recently, several books with the University of Notre Dame Press on the philosophy of the person. Uh, our format will be as follows. Uh, Dr. Walsh and I will have a conversation to introduce the topic for about a half hour or maybe 40 minutes. And then we'll open the floor for questions, asking you to use the raise hand function on Zoom. It's down below under the reactions button. Uh, and I'll recognize the questioners and then ask you to uh, unmute yourself to ask the question. So let's get started. Uh, Dr. Walsh, you'll remember last time we ended with a question about Heidegger. And I think we decided Time was out and we were gonna punt it to you at the beginning of this session. And uh, it turns out you've actually written a chapter of a book on Vogelin and Heidegger. So I wonder if, if, if to help put Vogelin in context, we could just start by saying, uh, by asking the question, what's Vogelin's relation to Heidegger or the relation of Vogelin's thought to Heidegger's thought? I don't think anybody's ever thought he was a Heideggerian. <laughs> I know that uh, Dr. Cooper, Dr. Uh, Barry Cooper at the beginning mentioned that in his autobiog autobiographical reflections, uh, Vogelin speaks of having been inoculated against Heidegger uh, who had captured the imagination of so many of the uh, young scholars back in Germany and Vienna um, uh, when he went mm -hmm. back to the continent. Uh, but how would, you, how would you address that question of Vogelin and Heidegger just to sort of put in perspective the topics that we'll discuss today. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's great to see you. And uh, thank you for uh, putting together this series, which I think is immensely valuable uh, to people interested in Vogelin and as a wonderful way of bringing together uh, uh, people interested in Vogelin from all over the world. Um, we even have, uh, I've discovered uh, um, a, a, an Irish friend living in Nairobi uh, on, on the call today. So uh, that's the great thing about this format. We could never do that if we were sitting in the, in the Eric Vogel Institute seminar room, uh, fine and, and, and uh, wonderful as it is. Uh, but so thank you, thank you, Jim, for, for this wonderful initiative. Um, uh, yes, your question is an interesting one. Um, First of all, remarks in autobiographical reflections uh, should be treated with a certain amount of, not exactly skepticism, but um, scrutiny. <laughs> um, yeah. the, the, the autobiographical I'm reflections uh, were, I'm not were, kidding the audio. Sorry. Uh, were generated by um, uh, Eno Sandoz in well, the yeah. open over about three, three weeks. Uh, I think in the summer of 75, 76. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, they're not necessarily the gospel truth of, even from, uh, in terms of accuracy. Um, and uh, I do think that that was, that was that's probably a, a little bit of an overstatement uh, to say that Vogan had no connection to Heidegger. Um, yes, yeah, certainly he was never a student of Heidegger. In fact, Vogan came into uh, the philosophy through law and through uh, that much more sort of uh, social science background, sociology, Otmar Spahn, and all of that. Uh, so, um, let me let me leave. Education in philosophy uh, is something that that took a while. 
Uh, now, uh, and then uh, the high point of, of Heidegger's, uh, uh, you could say, elevation as the uncrowned king of philosophy is probably in the 1920s, when Vogel is traveling around the US <laughs> for a good bit of that. So naturally, he's not going to come across Heidegger until much later. Uh, but the interesting thing is, for anybody who reads Vogel, they will think, yeah, that sounds vaguely like Heidegger. Uh, the essay in Anamnesis, Eternal Being in Time, uh, is probably Exhibit A. Now, when he went back to Germany, he, of course, uh, uh, gave a nasty swipe at Heidegger in uh, science, politics, and, and Gnosticism. So he certainly had a rather negative view of him. But that was in the context of a public lecture where Vogel was about to embark on uh, a series called Hitler and the Germans. Uh, in which he uh, explained how everybody was responsible for Hitler, not just Hitler himself. <laughs> so, and Heidegger was, was certainly high up on that list. So it's a complicated scene. Um, um, uh, Lee, uh, not Lee, Lee, Lee Trepanier and, and Steve McGuire, when they put that volume together, in which I did, did that essay, um, they uh, uh, caused me to, to go into, um, to, sorry, Sorry, I did exactly what, what we always do at church, which is to say, silence your cell phones. <laughs> Heidegger calling. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, should be, that should have been your announcement, you know, Jim, to silence your cell phones. Um, uh, when, when, when they invited me to do the essay, I went back and looked through uh, uh, Vogelin's text, and I realized that actually Vogelin has continuous references to Heidegger. Uh, from time to time. And so he's clearly keeping up with him. Uh, now, he didn't invite Vogelin uh, to any session at uh, uh, the University of Munich, and obviously was not uh, in, on friendly terms in any sense with him uh, when he went back there to Germany, as that might have been the case. Um, so it was a very distant uh, kind, of, kind of connection. Uh, but it, I think they, they converge in terms of a common project. Most of all, that's uh, that's the big the big issue with, between them. Uh, well, that's Heidegger, what we want to hear, right? So yes. that that's exactly. Uh, I'm I'm really interested then to hear what you think was. How would you describe that common project that they have? Well, the common project is what uh, Heidegger calls the ontological difference, the difference between being and beings, uh, and uh, for Vogelin, it's the difference between the ground the transcendent and uh, imminent reality, uh, everything else. Uh, once that becomes the, 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 the pivot of your thinking, then you're more or less traveling in a kind of parallel direction. Uh, how, do you, how, do, how does the world of imminence, the world of this world, the world of objectivity relate to a world that's beyond it and to um, a source, a ground, a principle, uh, or a being beyond it. Uh, so that's probably the first and major one. Uh, and and uh, they, have a, they, have, they share a common conviction, I think, that that really is, is the central axis of Western thought and of Western philosophy, and uh, remains so today. Uh, and they have, share a common, uh, you could say, lament that it has been forgotten. Uh, and that now we think that uh, we live in a world of subjects and objects and that that's all there is. Uh, but not in a world in which beyond subjects and objects, there lies a ground, a source, a beginning, and uh, a presence or an absence, whatever way you want to call it, uh, that uh, is the defining relationship. Now, Vogel in in facing this crisis, I think unlike Heidegger, but we can leave Heidegger aside for now and uh, uh, unless you, you want to bring him back, but Vogel looks back to history, right? Into the whole range of human history for some guidance about how man relates to this divine ground. And that's the topic, isn't it? In some way of that essay on equivalences. Uh, yes. What does he mean by that term equivalences and 
how does that uh, help inform the use he makes of history? Um, well, um, there's also a great contrast between Vogelin and Heidegger in that regard. Um, um, uh, Vogelin is, is the guy who um, traverses the entire course of history in order to, to visit, uh, uh, to learn from it, to map it, uh, to absorb it. I, uh, he's the cosmopolitan, uh, the guy who goes everywhere. Uh, uh, Heidegger is the guy who stays at home uh, and who bur buries into, uh, burrows into one question, the question of being. They're parallel, nevertheless, but they're not, they're very different, um, um, you could say, mindsets, very different mentalities, very different ways of going about the world. Uh, Vogelin is the cosmopolitan, and, and Heidegger is the, um, the, the solitary, uh, single minded uh, thinker about things. Um, and now, and now uh, what, what, what also, uh, what, 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 what unites them, I think, is that Vogelin is not just, um, a sampler and classifier of things, somebody who ranges far and wide. Uh, he's also somebody who brings it together and he brings it together in light of the, the kind of question that Heidegger had about the source of things and, and of being. So that's, uh, uh, that's how, where the equivalences essay comes from. The equivalences essay is one of Vogelin's great um, summative statements. It's a towering uh, essay uh, in which he tries to explain how it's possible uh, for one person at a certain place and time uh, to map out uh, uh, all of, uh, you could say, what can be known about the history of man's search for order uh, without regarding it as simply the succession of one thing after another, and without simply regarding it as what uh, Leo Strauss referred to as historicism, historically relative and contingent observations none of which will remain absolutely true. Uh, how can you have a trans-historical perspective on things that are historically contingent, finite, and uh, transient? That's the question behind it. Uh, because nothing remains the same in history. So uh, how do we find that? How do we or how do we arrive at but what, what Hegel called absolute knowledge or the perspective of absolute knowledge, uh, the perspective of the absolute on things? Uh, does, uh, does, does Vogel think there is such a perspective or is his account of history cyclical? Uh, no, it's not cyclical. Um, uh, cyclical is, is, is not, um, uh, it, it remains within, um, um, you could say a, a um, an intelligible relationship that has a kind of forward movement. Uh, so, I mean, cyclical linear, these are rather, um, I think, um, uh, inadequate. Uh, it's, it's quite, it's an inadequate language to describe what, what, what he's interested in. Initially, order and history followed a chronological framework, but then he realized that that's only one line of meaning. Uh, in other words, uh, what are the lines of meaning that are enduring and permanent? Uh, and that uh, we're crisscrossing, looking at parallels, looking at juxtapositions, or we're looking at a chronological framework uh, applied to it. Basically, what it comes down to is how is, how is it possible for somebody in the 21st century uh, to understand somebody uh, in uh, the 21st century uh, BC. Uh, you know, how is it possible for us to, to uh, uh, understand one another over these long stretches of time? Uh, what is it that, that makes a commonality, a common frame of reference, and the conversation of mankind? Uh, he, um, um, there's a, uh, there's a collection of, of lectures that, that Bogman gave called The Drama of Humanity. That's equally a, a kind of a title for what he's, what he's thinking about, that there is an ongoing drama in which the, uh, the human participants can indeed, with effort, with difficulty, but nevertheless, with considerable success, um, uh, 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 you could say, reach 
uh, understanding of one another. Um, and that's, um, that's what the equivalence is. is. Uh, to say that there is a common language, a common framework, a common way of understanding one another, that's not reducible to any one of those languages or frameworks that uh, emerge within history. It's, a, it's an amazingly sophisticated um, uh, notion and one that challenges basic, basically all of the intellectual um, conventions with which uh, scholarship approaches uh, uh, investigations. So I, I take it, I guess I'm wondering who are the ones trying to understand whom, right? So, uh, and, and is there any way to, to sort of focus in on what's at issue? And uh, so let me give you one possible way that I think he wouldn't include, but maybe he would, right? Uh, we, uh, Alexander wants to understand Achilles and Caesar wants to understand Alexander and Napoleon wants to understand Caesar, all with yeah. the same aim of conquering the world. Is that the kind of thing Vogelin is talking about when he's talking about uh, uh, equivalences? Uh, it's a sort of famous political example. Sure, there are equivalences at that level. Um, okay. Uh, but that's not uh, the most uh, important uh, level. Yeah. Uh, uh, ambition, the pursuit of uh, conquest, glory, uh, expansion. Um, we're looking at one today uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are not new things. We can recognize them in, con in the context of equivalent uh, variants in history. Uh, but that's not the most interesting equivalence. Uh, in a sense, those are equivalences at a mundane level. Um, what, are, what are most interesting are the equivalent experiences uh, in which order, the order of the whole is illuminated. So we begin to get an insight into who we are as human beings, how we fit in, in terms of the order of things, how we relate to the source of everything. Those are the big questions. It's the equivalences in the big questions uh, that are really central. The equivalences in, in, you could say, mundane political strategy, tactics, and uh, patterns, they're there. Um, there's no doubt about it, uh, but they're not, they're not the central thing. And so in these equivalences, are there sort of greatest hits? I mean, certain, as it were, and I mentioned four of the great or three of the great conquerors, right? And uh, uh, is there something like that that happens in man's attempt to understand the order of the whole. Are there certain moments? I think maybe that's a Hegel, Hegelian word, but are there certain moments, are there certain crucial eras that feature more, um, that feature principally in that understanding uh, as opposed to um, what's going on in say ordinary times, maybe even our time? Uh, there are uh, various high points, yes. Um, and, um, you could say the first one is um, the realization that we live in a cosmos, an order, that the whole that we live within is ordered. Um, that's, that's something that's gained in uh, the high civilizations of the ancient world, uh, especially the ones that Bogdan began with, but uh, the, the Egyptian, Assyrian, Mesopotamian, and so on, but also um, uh, uh, you could see, you could say the uh, the earlier phases of uh, India, China, uh, and um, uh, even um, uh, equivalent equivalent cosmological empires and orders. Uh, that itself is a kind of um, you could say um, uh, recognizable series of parallels, and uh, that, uh, um, those who study. Um, uh, paleontology uh, uh, referred to it as the human revolution. Uh, Marshak uh, and the book the, and, and uh, Barry Cooper's book on uh, the, uh, the early Paleolithic um, and Vogelin's interest in those things was driven by that, that there is a kind of breakthrough uh, even in terms of cosmological order. The big one after that is of course the breakthrough, the break away from cosmological order. The realization that we do not simply live in relation to a cosmos, a whole, where the cosmos itself provides us with the analog or the model of what order means. Uh, and that beyond the cosmos, 
there lies another level of reality altogether, something that is utterly different, uh, something that uh, is not visible, tangible, uh, you could say, uh, um, uh, presentable in terms of uh, any analogs within the cosmos, something that's mysterious, something that is a ground beyond everything else. Uh, that's the big breakthrough uh, that generates uh, the world religions uh, and that uh, uh, you know, constitute for all of them different levels of, um, you could say, a different, a different degree of, of, of uh, breakaway or breakthrough from the cosmological or the compact past. Uh, Vogelin refers to this as a movement from compactness to differentiation. Uh, he's not the only one to identify that. Uh, in fact, it's well, well enough recognized. Uh, philosophy itself fits within that mode. And uh, Carl Jaspers and his book, uh, The Origin and Goal of History, refers to it as the axial age, the age in which the discovery of man's openness to a transcendent uh, uh, divinity and therefore uh, the constitution of a universal human nature uh, emerges from things. Uh, those are the, 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 the big turning points. Uh, so roughly um, a, a period, you know, um, uh, up to the time of Christ uh, from, you know, seven, seven or eight, 800 uh, BC to, uh, to about the time of Christ. Um, <clears throat> uh, those are certainly the, 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 the high points. Uh, and there, there are parallels in each of those cases. Is, is philosophy then, because that's the second of the essays in our series, or the third essay, I guess, uh, this, this essay, Reason the Classic Experience, which I've also heard some presented as sort of central to Vogel's thinking, that seems to present philosophy as maybe the first among equals, first among equivalences. Is that true? Or is philosophy just one of these world religions that uh, emerges at that time and uh, takes its place in an array next to, I don't know, um, uh, Judaism, uh, uh, Confucianism, if you're counting yeah. that, and yeah. so forth, yeah. Buddhism, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, Taoism, yeah. Um, uh, you see, Jim, uh, you've been reading Bogdan long enough now that you're willing to consider um, such a, um, a, a destabilizing suggestion that philosophy may be a type of theology. Uh, <laughs> which is exactly what Bogan uh, references it as. Uh, religion is a different term and, and religion is, is a sort of uh, derivative term. Uh, Vogan liked to kid that nobody had any religion before Cicero invented the term uh, to bind back to, to, to religio, um, religare. Uh, you know, the, uh, none, n nobody had any religion. There's no religion of um, uh, the Mesopotamians or the Egyptians or, or the Chinese, um, just as uh, there's no Homeric religion. They did other things. We wouldn't say that they were religious. But wait uh, a minute, uh, D David, uh, I, I have a memory that Strauss says no one had any theology until Plato invented the term. Yes, and that would true. suggest it's somehow yeah. subordinate to philosophy. Well, <laughs> yes, they're both sort of invented terms, religion and theology. Uh, and so it takes a while, uh, you know, to develop a terminology in which you say, oh yeah, that's what we're doing. We're applying the logos to reflection on the theos, uh, on the divine. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that's, we begin with an experience of uh, the revelation and we reflect on it and that becomes theology, uh, becomes sacred science. So yes, uh, those are all, all things that happen later, but you have to have these events first. And that's, what makes Vogelin uh, uh, a, 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 you know, such an impressive figure is that he, and, and this is why he gave up the history of ideas. He begins with what were the real events that happened? What were the real experiences? And then much later, there is a kind of intellectual framework that kind of encompasses them or uh, you know, codifies them, makes them things that we can talk about more easily, uh, differentiated. So then the, the real experience of philosophy is actually the life of the philosopher. Is that it? I mean, in the life of the philosopher, as it emerges in classical Greece with uh, Parmenides, he mentions, and Heraclitus, and then 
uh, coming together in a special way somehow in the figure of Socrates, although he doesn't say too much about Socrates, he speaks mostly of those who write, his student, Plato, and then his student, Aristotle. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, uh, and, and of course, um, uh, we don't have much access to uh, pre-Socratic philosophy. Uh, only Diels and Krantz uh, gave us uh, access by, by publishing their fragments of the pre-Socratics. And, and Vogelin does his reconstruction effort to, to get back at that. Uh, and again, these are all uh, you know, sort of um, uh, reassembling and uh, they're, they're sort of um, uh, deep dives or deep explorations into what we can know of uh, from, from texts and materials that are left. But in each case, we're interested in what were the lived experiences, the lived events uh, in the life in, in, uh, on these occasions from which everything comes. So um, what makes the... yeah, so philosophy is a way of life. That's the big insight. And, and so what's distinctive about the philosophic way of life as opposed to the Taoist way of life or the Buddhist way of life would be what? Something to do with reason, right? I mean, that's why what he's getting at. Um, that or it's, um, it's, it's um, uh, as, as uh, Socrates said, the unexamined life is worth, not worth living. It's a way of examining life. It's a reflection on those formative events. It's a much more deliberative and um, intentional reflection on those illuminative, illuminative events. Illuminative events like that happen in, human, in, in, in the lives of human beings. Um, philosophers are the ones who manage to develop uh, a coherent, uh, language of reflection on, on those events. Uh, and that's where reason comes from. Reason is the rational reflection on those revelatory events. So for that reason, it is a type of theology. And that's how reason emerges in Vogel's account. Does it play a role in the question of how one lives one's life or, or what we might ordinarily call morality, at least outside of how one lives one, one's life when one is in philosophic conversation? Or is, is the focus of the way of life of philosophy on the sort of quest to know this order of the, of the whole and sort of what you do when you have to eat and deal with other people, that's its own sort of separate world that is not of concern to the philosophers. That's the cave as opposed to what's outside the cave in Plato's uh, symbol? Yes, that's true. Um, uh, but you have to remember that uh, the allegory of the cave is only an allegory. Uh, in reality, uh, uh, we who are in the cave know that we're in the cave and we begin a search and we're open to, so there's, so there's an awareness from the very beginning of what we're in search of. So, um, it you know, um, Philosophy doesn't begin with, with the, the decision to become, uh, to live a better life. It begins with the awareness that we have to live a better life. We are called to something higher. We're called to participate in a higher order of existence. Later, we can say, oh yeah, that means we've developed a moral law and have a moral, uh, have a, a notion of, of, of natural right. And we, uh, we attune our, our lives in that direction, but it's already there from the beginning. We're already, we're born, we could say, with a conscience. The awareness of right and wrong is all there, already there from the beginning. So it's not that that's invented or that that's introduced, but it's, it's you could say, what prompts the, the, the quest, the philosophic quest itself. It's not just a, an, an informational thing, not just a scientific or a speculative thing. It's also, we could say, an existential thing. Uh, Tolstoy has, a, has, a, has an essay called uh, what men live by, or a story called "What Men Live By," uh, is the search for to find what it is that that will be a means of living and and living life well. Well, that seems to lead to the last of the questions I was going to ask, but it might be the biggest one, and that's about that last essay in this section, which is called "The Gospel and Culture," because it it seems that. Well, this is what I've, I've, I've been trying to understand in Vogelin, and I'm not sure I, I do. It seems that Jesus is coming and the, and the gospel movement, I think, is that his phrase that he uh, uh, refers to as what comes out of, uh, of, of that moment, 
uh, that that's, I don't know, is that an equivalent uh, in Vogel's sense to what happened in Greece 350, 400 years before? Uh, is Socrates, an, uh, is Jesus an equivalent to Socrates in a way? If so, is there something new that's added? Uh, I'm always reminded in this context of Nietzsche's uh, uh, naughty remark that Christianity is just Platonism for the masses. Is that what Vogel's kind of saying, or is there something else happening here? Uh, no, but that's a great way of putting the question because um, it 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 um, uh, it suggests that they're all on the same level, and uh, that's certainly not Vogel's view. Vogel's view is that um, uh, Christianity is a differentiation or a development uh, well beyond the limits of Greek philosophy. So it is close to what we would normally understand as. as uh, revelation in a kind of uh, qualitatively different way, um, and that Christ is is um, uh, 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 divine in a in a way that is different from all other divinely inspired figures in this uh, great historical uh, quest of, of of the human race. Uh, uh, and, and you can see in, the, in that gospel and culture essay, Vogel has worked hard to find in the text a way, a marker or an identifier. Uh, and he's very much aware that, you know, when you look at the gospels, uh, they don't help you that much uh, because Christ is referred to as the son of God uh, or the anointed. Uh, well, lots of people were sons of God uh, and lots of people were anointed. Uh, King David was anointed. Uh, the Lord's anointed, Saul was anointed, you know, they're, so they're all equivalents at that level. Um, and so to say that Christ is different, you have to find um, a, a symbolic marker uh, in the experiences uh, that, that sort of identifies Christ that way. And he finds it in that neologism in, in Paul's uh, letter to the, to, the uh, 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 Thessalonians. Uh, that uh, Christ is the fullness of divine reality, the theotes. Um, the fullness of divine reality is a neologism that uh, he says Paul invents uh, in order to say, uh, in order to put his finger on what it is that's different about Christ. Well, Christ is not just a divine person, not just a holy man, uh, but the fullness of divine reality is present in him. And that's, of course, uh, gradually uh, articulated within the Christian community. Uh, uh, by, 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 by dint of the sort of friction of dealing with a different opposing conflicting interpretations, uh, the early church and so on, uh, the, the dogmas of um, uh, Christology and the Trinity. Uh, these are the ways in which the church, you could say, uh, hammers out uh, what it understands by Christ. And that hammering out certainly is in line with uh, that, uh, you could say, initial experience of Christ as not only divine, but utterly differently divine from all other exemplars. And I think Vogel is, in, is, is squarely in that category. So he's squarely a Christian thinker. Uh, but of course, uh, um, you know, it's important uh, to emphasize that Vogel is not a confessional thinker. He's not here interested in kind of uh, spreading the gospel or, or um, evangelizing you or anything else. Uh, he says, no, I'm just a scientist. I'm dealing with texts. And so that's why he- well, well, so he does that-, that So then I, th that sounds to me then that he's more Socratic than Christian or how, how does that work? I, I'm, uh, I'm looking at a, at page 267 in the reader. I don't know if you have it in front of you, but let me read a sentence there. This is precisely where he's dealing with this term theotes, yeah. uh, the neologism uh, yeah. uh, coined by Paul. And then he says, to the various translations as Godhead, divinity, or deity, which carry the implication of a personal God, yeah. I have preferred divine reality because it renders best the author's intention to denote a non-personal reality, which allows for degrees of participation in its fullness while remaining the God beyond the in-between of existence. Well, I, 
don't don't press me to translate all of that quite into uh, to, to political science English, but but um, I wonder if you could comment on that because that seems definitely heterodox from a Christian point of view, right? Because we we think of God as three persons in one within Christianity, at least within the doctrine of the Christ, of the Trinity. But maybe Vogelin is not interested in that. Maybe he thinks that's one of the problems, this notion of doctrine. But I'm especially interested in the notion of person, because I know you thought a lot about that and written a lot about that. How does this notion of the person relate to, and again, this other notion we haven't mentioned, this notion of the in-between, the metaxi that Vogelin emphasizes so much in his work, of human beings being somehow between uh, the animal and the divine? Well, that's a great question, Jim. And um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's obviously a little bit of a stumbling block for uh, readers of Vogelin, especially sympathetic readers uh, who happen to be Christian. But um, I, um, I'd say there are two defenses. One, the first defense is that um, uh, Vogelin is operating as not as, as I said, as a Christian theologian, but as um, a scholar of the texts. And uh, the dogma of the Trinity uh, takes a couple of hundred years, uh, uh, 300 years to, to develop beyond that. So, um, you know, it's not, it's, it's not, strictly speaking, it's not in the text. It takes the church itself um, uh, a considerable amount of time to discover exactly what it believes in. Now, you have to understand, therefore, that the, the question of, of faith and of belief uh, is not something that's a kind of uh, fully worked out event. It's something you're living it out and you're discovering it more and more as you go along. And so that's the process of differentiation that exists within uh, Christian theology, within the prayer life of the church. And Vogelin, I think, fully embraces that. So I think his scholarly method is consistent uh, with uh, a theological method uh, within the church itself. Uh, the other big reason why I think he, 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 he's, um, he doesn't want to jump too rapidly to, a, to you could say, a personalized relationship uh, is that um, that begins to reduce the mystery of God. Uh, Christ becomes, uh, yeah, you know, the guy whom you meet uh, uh, in the town in Jerusalem, uh, you know, uh, he becomes a figure in history, uh, and you could say the re his relationship to the God who's beyond, uh, you know, is not so clear then. Especially, and this is, you know, where we said the, the parallel with Heidegger, I think it's important that um, they're both interested in um, opening us up to the mysterium tremendum, uh, the great mystery beyond all that cannot be encompassed, cannot be said. Uh, and uh, Within Christian mysticism, this is uh, the apophatic uh, approach. Uh, so it's all consistent with that. Uh, not, there's not, that's not a big departure. Now, having said all of that, uh, I do think that there's also a, a, a point within it in which uh, the personal uh, aspect uh, could be, um, say, more, given more nuance uh, than even Vogelin does there. Um, I think a large part of both Heidegger and Vogel are, are resistant to making the person central to things or to thinking of God as personal or thinking of being as personal. Um, and I think that's, you could say, a somewhat regrettable side uh, that, that each of them have because uh, it suggests that to be a person is therefore to be um, a finite concrete being walking around at a particular space and time. The reality is that persons have an openness that always transcends their particular setting in space and time. And they have a mysterious uh, depth that can never be communicated. So there is something of the ground in every person and every person is in some way a ground. Uh, and that's not, uh, that, that does, you know, I think that's, that's perfectly consistent in terms of a language of, of divinity, of the fullness of divinity, uh, of uh, the incarnation and so on. Uh, so I'd say, you know, Vogelin's, um, um, you could 
sort of hands-off approach on, you could say, the conventions of Christian theology uh, and a more sort of detached account of it um, is consistent enough with, you know, all of those different aspects. Well, I promised that uh, after 40 minutes, uh, I would stop <laughs> asking questions and I'd open the floor for others. And uh, calling me on that promise already is Paul Carangella, who has the first question. So, Paul, unmute yourself and uh, uh, mm -hmm. please go ahead and ask. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David and Jim. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, regarding divine reality, that phrase uh, that you quoted, Jim, from that page. Uh, the, I would emphasize the notion of it allows for participation. I think the emphasis on the personal and David is, is at the level that that the we each individual person, according to Vogel's sense, can participate in the mystery of divine reality. I, I don't know if that helps any, but that's my my comment. That's what struck me from his use of of, of that uh, his understanding of the little word in in Paul. David, what do you think? Sure, I'd agree. I'd agree with that. I mean, uh, I think that that's, uh, you know, um, uh, people always complained about Vogelin's treatment of Christianity, uh, and he seemed to concede that uh, it was somewhat incomplete. And um, he said, well, then you go ahead and finish it. Uh, you take it up. Uh, you know, it wasn't either. He, he wasn't offensive in any way about it. Uh, he said, you know, it was something you, you know that 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 remained to be um, unfolded. Yeah. Thank you. Next question from Stephen Waldorf. Um, so I have a question, David. Uh, that was a great overview. I very much um, appreciated uh, hearing that. Um, I have a question about uh, virtues and the language of virtue as a way of symbolizing order. So my um, understanding is that uh, for Vogelin, virtue as it occurs in Plato and Aristotle is a way of symbolizing the manner in which we attune ourselves to the, to the ground uh, of, of being and to transcendent order. But I was wondering the, the extent to which he does or does not differentiate that kind of an experience from the experience symbolized by the Christian infused virtues. And so I think, for instance, in Aquinas, there might be a basis to do so in the sense that um, for Aquinas, charity is a friendship with God and the transcendent. In the specific uh, call to participation in God's own beatitude, and so in an interpersonal communion with God that is, I think, qualitatively very distinct from what the Greeks uh, describe. And so I was wondering, does, does Vogelin try and differentiate at all the moral discourse of Christians from that of uh, other um, theorizers of, of, of order? Um, yeah, um, uh, thanks, Stephen. That's that's a great question and one that uh, is well worth investigating. Um, I would say that for Vogelin, um, uh, he uh, overturns the assumptions that lie behind the question. Um, he doesn't think that um, the Greeks represent a kind of natural virtue. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, I, yes, uh, the scholastics, um, uh, especially when Aristotle is brought back into the West, uh, have to find a place for him. And the most convenient way is to say, well, he um, covers what we would call well, the virtues that we could attain on our own natural virtue. And that beyond that, there are theological virtues uh, that are infused and that come through uh, divine revelation and grace. Uh, uh, Vogelin, again, uh, as an empirical investigator of things, would reject it and say, no, you can find faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and love uh, as even categories long before even Plato and Aristotle. 
uh, Heraclitus and others uh, mention it in, in almost exactly the same way. And uh, basically, the reason why um, the, uh, the reason why that's the case is that um, when human beings search for the source of the order of their existence, they have to hold in their hands the whole of, you could say, the direction of their lives. So they have to take an almost, you could say, transcendent stand on, on the whole of things. So all virtue is by definition, or by, you could say by, you could say existential necessity, uh, something that implicates the whole of your life. Um, you can't be, simply be unjust one day and say, no, for the rest now, I'm not going to worry. I'll, I'll be perfectly just. Uh, you can't just lie occasionally uh, and then uh, say, and that was just pre uh, last week or last month or last year. Um, uh, I was only an invader on this occasion, but afterwards I was a really nice guy. Um, uh, you know, uh, your uh, virtue is something that really um, says you, you're saying something about the totality of your existence. So it, by, by virtue of that, it opens up to something that's transcendent, something that's beyond uh, any limits, something that has something unconditional and unlimited about it. Uh, and that's, uh, that was um, his reading of the Greeks that you know, when if something that you live and die by is not mere merely finite consideration, uh, it's something that's uh, you could say an infinite imperative for you if you want to use that language. Uh, and uh, once you do that, then you begin to see that um, we find uh, very uh, interesting echoes even of the Christian virtues all over the place. And so the notion that there's natural and infused virtues is a little bit of a, just a pure convention. Uh, um, now, it is a long-lasting convention, definitely. Uh, but, you know, it's a little bit like uh, Thomas Kuhn's uh, uh, scientific paradigms, uh, that our thinking works through paradigms. And so that was a great paradigm for the medieval world. It, it was a, they were able to explain how you could have a totally naturalistic outlook on life as our, you find in Aristotle, and how you could have uh, in St. Augustine and, and, and Christianity, uh, a totally uh, transcendent revelatory outlook and put the two together without saying one's false, the other's not. All you, could say, all you can say, well, no, one's natural and the other's supernatural, they fit perfectly together. You begin with nature and you end up with some, something supernatural. Um, uh, that seems so perfect, uh, yet it's a paradigm that's been, you know, for the last 800 years, uh, constantly battling with adjustments, so it doesn't quite work. It has to be re, it has to be reaccommodated, recalibrated in one way or another, and we may well be at the end of that particular paradigm. I think Thank Bogdan you. would be one of the one of the one of the one of the uh, um, uh, Copernican overthrowers of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thomas, Thomas Lorden has the next question. David, uh, there was uh, in 1994, Michael Morrissey wrote a book on the theology of Vogelin, uh, and he said in part, of no other contemporary thinker could one say as unhesitatingly that the distinction between philosophy and theology for all practical and theoretical purposes virtually disappears. I believe Vogelin's entire is actually a veiled reconstruction of theology that I think theologians have by and large yet to recognize. And in the text that we're looking at uh, in pages 261 and 268, there Vogelin talks about the distinction drawn by most, seemingly most orthodox theologians between natural reason and revelation. And he says on 268 that uh, this distinction, this is a topic still favored by theologians who ought to know better. Um, have any theologians in the wake of Vogelin come to know this better? Uh, as Morrissey suggests, um, have, have any theologians caught up with Vogelin along these lines? <laughs> I think you'd have to, have to ask the theologians, uh, Tom, that question. Um, 
I'm not, you know. Uh, well, I'm, I'm talking to my favorite theologian, David. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a philosopher, except insofar as that's a type of theology. Um, uh, I'd say the, the big issue is that um, we live so much within the framework of this, of this, you could say, paradigmatic distinction between the natural and the supernatural, uh, between theology between nature and grace, uh, um, that uh, theology and philosophy, that you know, um, even from a disciplinary perspective, it's hard for theologians and philosophers to talk. But I would uh, suggest that um, if you look at the work of, um, I think, uh, the great theologians, um, someone like uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar. Um, you, the one thing you do notice is that uh, their theology, his theology, or the theology is about people like him, uh, is constituted around an engagement with philosophy. Uh, the realization that um, philosophy and, and, and theology uh, come together. Um, uh, John Paul II, uh, Fides et Ratio, uh, is, is a stinging rebuke to the distinction. Uh, that faith and reason are two wings, he says, uh, and that uh, every, each of them depends on, um, you know, holding that, that uh, convergence together. Uh, so, you know, I think we're, we're, in, we're in the process of a sort of steady revision of that uh, uh, scholastic paradigm, which Would you is agree with amazing. Sorry. Would you agree with uh, Morrissey that Vogelin tends to collapse the distinction? between philosophy and theology? That's a, an okay way of saying it. I wouldn't say, collab, collapse doesn't sound like it's the right choice of words. <laughs> Surpass the distinction. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say it's a collapse. He's, he's aware of it. Uh, and uh, he's, he's conscious of the, you could say, the difficulty of getting that across within the environment in which he operates. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why he um, insists that uh, he's neither a philosopher nor a theologian, uh, but simply um, a, a reader of texts in a rigorous and close way. Thank you. An empirical scientist. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Robbie Young. Uh, hi, David. Um, I hope it's okay to take the the discussion in a slightly different direction. Yeah, by all means. It's very contemporary. Uh, is there anything that you think in Vogelin's thought, in his writings, etc., which could help us to understand what is happening in Ukraine today? How do you think he would diagnose the whole situation in terms of his the various categories that he develops? Is that okay as a question for you? Sure. Um, you know, uh, Vogelin came from uh, Central Europe, uh, and uh, he, he, he knew that world well. He knew that uh, Europe and Central Europe uh, and Eastern Europe uh, basically uh, lived, was, was an area that lived between empires uh, and, uh, you know, had to negotiate uh, imperial powers uh, beyond it. Uh, and he, he had a very, uh, you know, in international relations, realist point of view on international relations. Uh, probably the clearest uh, uh, example of it um, was, are the sort of, is this concluding chapter of the new science of politics, where he uh, maps out his sort of hard bitten realist assessment of, of uh, in 1951, uh, where the world stood in terms of uh, the European balance of powers. Uh, and he thought that, that uh, it did not look good because uh, the West had demobilized and had abandoned uh, its security interests. Uh, and, uh, you know, this was before uh, the Cold War really got going. And in fact, uh, Vogan's own uh, book, uh, The New Science, uh, was immediately seized upon as a kind of uh, clarion call uh, for the West uh, to uh, organize itself. So 
uh, I think we're we're almost in a peculiarly um, parallel or or uh, um, you know uh, similar uh, case today, where uh, the West, the liberal uh, democratic powers, uh, they have given they they gave up on they've given up on on the uh, the notion of uh, great power politics, balance of power, and the need. Uh, to recognize uh, that and the need to recognize um, force of arms as an irreducible part of political reality. Uh, uh, nation states, when they're organized, um, uh, always possess the, the option of going to war. Uh, that's what it means to be in a nation state. And therefore, you have to be prepared for it, even if you're not, even if that's not a particularly attractive uh, option uh, for, for yourself. Uh, so it's it's simply you could say he 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 had, he had a very Machiavellian and Augustinian um, uh, realist hard bitten assessment I think of political political reality and would probably you know see it in those terms uh, and that you know uh, to be too um, uh, uh, sentimental about things uh, invites. Uh, Disastrous consequences, uh, uh, and to be an, to be a dreamer, an idealist, uh, someone who lives in another reality. I think that's what he would have rejected. But you know, that having been said, um, you know, uh, uh, frankly, I was a little I was I was a little shocked by uh, Vogelin's uh, coldly rational uh, analysis of things when I met him. <laughs> okay, uh, thank, thank you. you. Sure. Uh, our, our next question comes from the Vogelin Institute and the people who are gathered there. So uh, please unmute and uh, go ahead and see who's asking. Uh, Dr. Walsh, just a very brief question. What was Vogelin's view, if he stated it anywhere, on Bergson or Deschardins emergent evolution? Did he ever say express anything along those lines? I know he talks about reading Bergson, but did he ever talk about the, the emergent evolution view? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe Paul Carangella might, would, would be able to answer that. Um, it's not, there are certain points in Bogan where he kind of <clears throat> uh, comes close to it, he converges with it without necessarily um, developing it. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if he had some sense of that, but. Um, um, it, that side of, of um, there, are, there are many aspects, uh, you could say, of the, of the uh, contemporary philosophical uh, struggles that Vogelin was aware of, but never fully confronted himself. Um, he had his own interests and, and didn't attempt to do everything. Um, I'd say the main uh, point of convergence is his rejection, his rejection of a reductionist view of human nature. Uh, that uh, and and uh, uh, this comes out in numerous places. Uh, so, to the extent that um, uh, Bergson and Deschardins, in different ways, they're not the same. Um, uh, uh, you know, to the extent that they, you know, find a, are, are looking for a way to think about how is it that we are uh, biological material, physical entities that have an evolutionary past and yet carry within us um, a spiritual trajectory beyond this world. How do you understand that? How do you explain it? Uh, politically, uh, it's, a, it's crucially, it, it's a very important question to answer. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm just guessing here that Bogdan would have regarded those efforts as somewhat respectable, but not necessarily central to his own approach, uh, but convergent with it. Thank you. Um, um, there are a Stoner? couple questions. Yes. Uh, Pei Dong Wu had a question. Could I ask it for him? Uh, he yes, go leave. ahead. While you've, while you've got the floor in the room, go ahead and ask. I know he had to leave for a class. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so Pedong asks you, Professor Walsh, how does one distinguish between the divine and transcendence in Vogelin's thought? When one transcends, is this to meet the divine 
Or in meeting the divine, is there a further reality that encapsulates that meeting between the divine and man? Very good question. Very good question. Um, um, usually, I think Vogelin, uh, Vogelin usually employed the term the metaxi, uh, the in-between to describe uh, the condition in which we as uh, human beings find ourselves. And therefore, uh, to encounter the transcendent is to go beyond the in-between and therefore uh, to transcend it. Uh, of course, that's implied in, in the notion of a between, but it's also the boundary. Uh, so it's a mysterious event. Um, I would, what I would emphasize um, in my reading, I'm not sure that this is necessarily um, a universal one, uh, that um, Vogelin's big um, uh, weight is placed on uh, revelation, on the idea that the transcendent reveals itself to us, uh, that uh, we do not reach the transcendent. The transcendent uh, reaches into our consciousness and experience. And that's when the encounter occurs. So, you know, in, um, in some sense, this is to go back to uh, Stephen Waldorf's question, where, where is the infused virtues or where's the, where's the, where's the element of grace in Vogelin? Uh, it particularly is in recognizing that uh, the encounter with the transcendent is a gift from the side of uh, that which is transcendent from the divine side. Uh, it's not something that we're, we, can, we can order up, we can command, uh, or that we can reach through our own efforts. Um, and that's an irreducible aspect of it. Uh, and that's an integral part of the experience itself. The encounter is an encounter uh, that is, you could say, uh, unbidden and unrequired, undemanded, and incapable of, uh, of, of actualization uh, on its own. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple other live questions, but there's there have been a couple that are in the chat. I'm gonna read one of them okay. uh, and invite the um, questioner to chime in if he wants to add to it. This is from Glenn Hughes. Vogelin finds the ontological identity that in the end renders it valid to refer to true equivalences of human experiences and symbolizations to reside in a mysterious depth of the cosmos in which all participate. Can you say something about ways we might explore this depth for ourselves, further symbolize it or live the truth of it? Seems to me actually this comes right out to where we just left off, so. Um, a little bit, um, but, but it doesn't actually come from the revelatory uh, side of things, uh, the encounter uh, uh, in my reading of that essay. That's a great uh, question, Chip, and one that I struggled with myself. Um, uh, 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 so um, uh, it's good that you didn't have to provide a, a commentary to the selections in the reader. <laughs> <laughs> or left it up to us readers to uh, to make our own comments on it. Um, that that's that's a Vogel um, uh, refers to a mysterious depth of things, um, and um, uh, in his famous little um, little uh, diagram of, of saying he has the poles as as um, the, the noose and the apiron, uh, the depth in which he locates as the depth. Uh, there's, there's a lot of ambiguity, I think, about all of that. Um, when, he, when he's dealing with the notion of a depth, what he really seems to su suggest is that, um, uh, the, it, it, and this goes back to the question of an impersonal or a non-personal reality, uh, that um, things come to us and are revealed to us from we know not where. And so, uh, the very notion of a depth is that it, we can't include it, we can't contain it, uh, we can't master it. Um, uh, and he, he invokes it, particularly, I think, in, as far as I recall, referring to the faith that underpins science. 
that science as, as a, a you could say, a faith in the reliability of causality uh, is itself uh, something that can't be caused or can't be accounted for in terms of causality, but that really uh, um, resides or rests on uh, an, a, a trust in the cosmos, in, which is itself a trust in this depth of things. Uh, and that's a, and that's a kind of aspect here that we probably haven't uh, given enough weight to in, in the discussion. And that is that um, as intellectuals, we're always thinking that everything is about arguments and how we process things and how we analyze things. But really, it's the attitude we bring to it that's decisive. It's the orientation. It's the pre-reflective dispositions that are there, that, are, that is really crucial. Uh, and this is what faith, of course, means. Uh, and this is what it means for, uh, for Vogelin, I think. Uh, uh, an openness, a trust in the order of being. Uh, so right from the very beginning, we're, uh, we're required to yield to certain promptings and certain inclinations and certain invitations that are there. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, this issue of the depth, you could say, is really um, the invitation to be open to a revelation that of how, the, or how things are in the cosmos, how things are in the order, of, uh, the order of things, the order of objects, but it's also an invitation to be open to that which is the source of things. Now I think Bogan could go down a little bit further and say it's an invitation to encounter the person or persons uh, that are beyond it all. But that's another uh, uh, argument and issue. Uh, but it is uh, uh, it's the pre-analytic source of our thinking, which is not in, in, uh, encompassed in the way in which we think about things. And that's, of course, the great problem uh, in uh, communication, uh, discourse, um, a negotiation, everything. Everything comes down to uh, the spirit in which they are undertaken. Chip, did you want to follow up? No, I think uh, I think David uh, touched on the question I had, which is based on uh, remembering a chat that I had with you one time, David, in which uh, we were talking about the equivalences essay, and you mentioned that um, that it's incomplete. Yeah, uh, um, and and I think you 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 touch on what what you probably meant by saying that by referring to the, um, the 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 fact that all of this is an invitation to a further encounter in which there is a a kind of um, um, interpersonal in an analogical sense yeah. um, encounter with the um, with the ground of the depth. I think that's what you sure yeah yeah that that's basically what I was alluding to um, uh, 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 you know so I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know that maybe have, yeah, maybe enough to say yeah. yeah yeah we have a few more questions uh, and just a few more minutes so yeah. uh, questioners be succinct and uh, I'm sure Dr Walsh will be as well uh, next is Henry Krull. Could you unmute yourself, please? Hi, uh, good discussion so far, very interesting. Um, so some things that have been said suggest that uh, monism eventually swallows dualism, uh, that the person seems to have a particularly interesting situation or disposition in things. Uh, this discussion seems to consider a lot about meaning. We've said uh, equivalence and order uh, but importantly, all from the view of or in relation to the individual. Um, and so this is where my question comes from about the individual. Uh, in the body of some sort of Vedic or Vedantic uh, yogic practice or tradition, um, one might interpret some notion to be pointing toward uh, supra-individual experience or super-individual experience that experience is possibly not bound within the individual and even in philosophy today there's some consideration about consciousness as experience as not 
contained within the individual. Um, so I'm wondering what may, may be able to be said of Vogelin's understanding of these individual non-specific notions of consciousness as, as experience. Thank you, David. Uh, he seems to uh, waver in that direction more than uh, more more uh, more than certainly more than once, uh, and to think about the ground as uh, beyond merely a personal ground is 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 one that um, beyond the personal God uh, is certainly is the use of that category of the ground is, already suggests that it's not simply uh, a personal ground a personal reality um, of revelation. Um, I'm, um, and, and Vogel himself uh, uh, said that um, his introduction to meditation was reading the Upanishads. Uh, so he certainly was well acquainted uh, with um, an impersonal depth and a depth beyond revelation. He constantly refers to that. Um, I, the only thing I would suggest is that uh, there's, in the end of the day, that doesn't necessarily eliminate persons. Every personal encounter is with a depth beyond what can be said or revealed. The person is, as, as St. Augustine said, a depth so deep as to be hid from him in whom it is. So I think that they, they all, uh, uh, all of those uh, uh, perspectives are on a continuum more than being, you could say, opposing or divergent. Perhaps Great. the last question. Perhaps the last question then from uh, Sixto Garcia. Please unmute. Please, please unmute yourself. Can you click the, there you go. Uh, thank you, Professor Walsh. You mentioned the name of Hans Urs von Balthasar. I should like to add the names of uh, Karl Reiner, the German Jesuit, and uh, the uh, and Enrico Lubac, the French Jesuit too. Um, they pretty much said the same thing. There is no such thing as pure human nature, pura natura, that's a neo-scholastic concept. And it was not in Thomas. They appeal to Thomas's, the prima secunde question 113, article 10, that says of its own nature, of its own identity, the human spirit is capable of grace, is made for grace. So I think that's how contemporary theologians have responded to the uh, issue of the relationship between philosophy and theology, the natural and the supernatural. Thank you. I think that's a great observation. And um, uh, I think Vogelin, um, Vogelin had great admiration for uh, von Balthasar and for de Lubac, somewhat less so for Rotter, but he recognized you know, that he was doing something parallel. Um, one thing that uh, Vogelin liked to quote was uh, uh, St. Thomas's uh, question, is Christ the head of all uh, mankind? Uh, and uh, I think he was very pleased to, to, uh, to see uh, St. Thomas affirming that, that he's not just the head of uh, Christian believers, but that it's a, it is an embracing uh, headship and uh, mystical body. The mystical the corpus, body, mysticum, the yeah, corpus yeah. mysticum, he says, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Well, well since uh, that was so, sick, so succinct, we have time for just one very last question, which comes again from Paul Carangela, who had asked at the beginning. So, Paul, you started us, so you get the last word. I mean, well, until what David said. David gets the last word. <laughs> Please unmute, Paul. For some reason, I can't. Uh, you got it now. You're, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, regarding uh, uh, the Ukraine, uh, I'm wondering if it's possible, uh, Jim, David, uh, Chip, or others, to uh, enlist uh, some discussion with Martin Paulus. I think Martin has been in Prague uh, for the last couple of weeks, maybe coming home now, and I'm sure he would have something to say. I'm not sure in what format. So I'm just suggesting is it possible to set something up with Martin for a, a group discussion? That's my question. Well, I, would well, I think that was directed to me, wasn't it, David? I <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, well, I, 
last time the last question asked about Heidegger and it was easy to punt that to the next session and uh, David Walsh gave us an excellent uh, response there. I don't know what I can promise you for next time, but uh, John von Haking I see is with us. So you better bone up on your Ukrainian uh, 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 Russian knowledge. So uh, you're ready to go. We, we'll meet again um, two weeks from uh, today for our last session. John will be our speaker. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David Walsh, and please others uh, join, uh, join me in thanking uh, David for a very enlightening uh, session. Thank you all very much for wonderful questions and wonderful conversation. And thank you for, for, for participating in this.